Lynn Hiles Ministries presents Dr. Lynn Hiles, That You Might Have Life. And here's your host, Dr. Lynn Hiles. I want to welcome you back to the program again this week. And as you can see, I have a guest on with me again. This is the fourth week that I've had my son, Jeremy, on the program with me. Jeremy Pastors, the Church of Winchester, Virginia. They have had to be meeting here recently, uh, you know, uh, via remote and through a uh, live stream because the building they were using uh, had to close because of COVID and are, they're not allowed to open that building. If you live in the Winchester, Virginia area and you have something to offer to him, it would be, they've looked and it's, they've just not been able to find anything where they can meet in person again. But if you'd like to uh, reach out and say, hey, here, here's something that you can use, please contact us or contact him. And uh, they, they'd probably be glad to hear from you. But we've been talking about the book of Joshua and how it pictures Moses, my servant, is dead. That's the old covenant. Arise now and possess your possession. Joshua comes on the scene because Joshua is the Hebrew name Yeshua. It is the name Hebrew name Jesus. Moses brought you out with a rod, but Jesus brings us in with a mercy seat. And we've been talking about how there has to be a shift in the way you think because if you have lived in a tent your entire life and you've been on a wilderness journey, it takes some kind of a paradigm shift to think from uh, moving from, uh, you know, living in a tent to living in a house you didn't build, living in the wilderness where it's day by day to living in the promised land where there's an abundance. And sometimes, I think sometimes there is almost as if, uh, you know, we have moved from, and there was 42 stations actually from Egypt to the promised land. Every one of them speak to some experience that people are in, in their journey. But I was thinking, uh, and I didn't get a chance to say this in the last one, but when they came to the end of that wilderness journey and they're ready to enter into the promised land, the manna ceased. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 I was just thinking, this just came to me while I was, while you were talking in the, you know, when we were talking mm -hmm. last week about it, the manna ceased. And I think, I, I, I thought to myself, you know, that really speaks to me because we're living in an hour when God ain't acting like he's supposed to, yep. seemingly. Like, well, wait a minute, where's the magic wand at? You know, where, where, where's the manna in the backyard at? I mean, the manna ain't falling in the backyard anymore. It's like, okay, this stuff has, some of this stuff has dried up. I'm not saying God doesn't do miracles anymore. That's not yeah. what I'm saying at all. I'm just saying sometimes I think he dries some stuff up in one realm because he knows we will stay there as long as the manna keeps falling. Mm -hmm. But when we get hungry enough and ambitious enough to say, I'm going to cross over this Jordan, that there's something on the other side of this river that belongs to me. And it's time for me to take my inheritance. I think sometimes I say, I think people go through crises of faith, and sometimes I have to remind myself even that, you know, when, you know, uh, John the Baptist went through a crisis of faith, you know, when he, he, he declares very boldly when, you know, Jesus walks down over the river Jordan, he said, right there's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he's boldly declaring that. But the night before they're going to chop his head off, he says to his disciples, go ask him, are you the one? <laughs> or should we look for another? Yep. Now you'd think that, you know, Jesus would give him a straight up answer, but he doesn't. He doesn't just say, go tell John, yeah, I'm the dude. Or, or he doesn't even, you would think he would say, see, you know, sometimes I want, why, well, why didn't God just move and get John out of prison? Because there's places in the scripture where sometimes, you know, he delivered yeah. from the fire furnace. Sometimes he delivered Peter from jail. And sometimes, in other words, it was different. There's different things that happen in different places. But John is about to be beheaded in the morning. He's the cousin of Jesus. Jesus says to him, you go tell John, the blind see, the deaf hear, and the poor have the gospel preached to him. In other words, he was saying to John, you came thinking, I was going to come like refiner's fire and fuller soap, and the work, you know, uh, you know, my fan is in my hand, I'm going to thoroughly purge my floor, which was all Malachi versions of Jesus. But he says to John, who's having a crisis of faith, because his preconceived idea of how Jesus should act he wasn't acting like that. Mm -hmm. He wasn't killing everybody. He wasn't destroying the Romans. He didn't come. In other words, judgment wasn't falling yet. Yep. And Jesus said, go remind John of the Isaiah version. The eyes of the blind shall be opened. The deers, 
remind John of the first public message I preached was he has sent me to open the eyes of the blind, to, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the gospel to the poor. That was his first public message. In other words, tell John, yeah, that Malachi version is still valid. It's going to come in about 70 AD, but I didn't come to do that first. I came to call the people back. I came to give them opportunity mm-hmm. to come into the covenants of promise. But I'm simply after this, Jesus said, go tell John, blessed is he who's not offended in me. In other words, when God ain't acting like he's supposed to, don't be offended. Maybe he's doing something bigger. And there's a lot of people right now that think, man, God's about to judge this planet. The judgment of God is falling. This ain't the judgment of God. God is not mad. He's, he's not mad at us. He's mad about us. And when our version of him don't come to pass, then our faith is shaken. Mm-hmm. And maybe he didn't come to do something bad. Maybe he came to open the eyes of the blind, set at liberty the blind bruised, and bring a massive shift towards Reformation like I just taught a whole series on. And maybe that's sometimes why the manna ceases in the wilderness is to get people ready to move into the next thing that God has to do, and that is to possess our possessions and live in the promised land and live in Christ and flow from Him rather than wait on something to fall in the backyard again. And when that changes, sometimes that's difficult because we want to go back to the good old way. So I don't know if you can jump in there or not, but well, you uh, know, even when you talk, we think about like you know that when once they crossed that that Jordan, you know, it wasn't before they crossed the Jordan, but after they crossed the Jordan is when they came to the hill of foreskin, where they where they were all being circumcised because there's some of those old mentalities and that came from that wilderness and came from that whole journey that needs to be yep. removed and cut off from that's us. Powerful. You know, so that we have. A real change Even of mind. Even religious ideas yeah. need to be so, yeah. You know, there because it, again, you know, like you said, there's it's easy sometimes to, you know, and one of the things, you know, we've been we've been pretty lucky in our lives, you know, uh, my brother Jason and I especially, we've always been challenged to think and to, you know, really, you know, not just not just hear messages and live according to messages, but to really, you know, we've been really taught how to have a relationship with God to, you know, ask him, come to him and, and really just kind of seek the mind of Christ sometimes. And I, me, especially I'm, I'm, I'm one that's really kind of a thinker anyway. And I like to think things through and just kind of, you know, like, I just kind of like watch stuff and see, you know, what, try to figure see what God's doing in the midst of stuff. Uh, I, I remember being in services sometimes and, and standing in the back in the past. I remember a pastor one time saying to me, like, you're, you stand back and you just like, you just kind of watch what's happening and you don't speak until you've just kind of almost like you figured out what God's trying to say. He said, everybody else wants to jump in, try to figure, you know, and run it through their paradigm. And he says, but you kind of look and see, well, what's God really trying to do in the middle of this? And that's how I've been even through the pandemic and stuff like that. It's like, okay, let's, you know, I, I, God is never, to me, God never falls off the throne. He never ceases to be God. He's not, uh, he's not messing me up. He's not, you know, like, you know, and so I'm just trying to see what's trying to happen through the midst of this. And I really believe that through the midst of it, God is doing something greater than we can see. You know, that we, we, again, we've talked about great moves of God in the past and how, you know, God's done this, God's done that. But in the midst of things, I think for one, the church really has to have a mind change. It really needs a repentance right now. It needs some mind change from old covenant ways of thinking to a new covenant way of thinking and seeing, you know, uh, again, we there's a lot of mentality in the church that look at stuff that's going on and going, well, this is just the judgment of God. And mm-hmm. it's just, it's just, it's, it's about to happen rather than God trying to get people that are, that are sons and daughters of God to become an answer to the world. Yep. You know, to have some mind change to be like, I'm, I, you know, I'm not going to wait on God. We don't need to wait on God to do yep. something He's put, he's put us here. Yeah, you know, it's kind of like John. I don't mean to interrupt no, you, but it's kind of like John who said, you know what, are you the one who should, we should look for another? But, you know, from the time John, John points Jesus out, said, there's the Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world, many of John's disciples started following Jesus. No. It would have been a good idea if John would have followed him. Mm-hmm. Maybe John wouldn't have lost his head. But, you know, there's a few people that didn't stay. They, yeah. they, they couldn't let go of that old thing still, so they still couldn't make that mind no. shift themselves. So they're now, because God ain't, acting like they think he's supposed to, 
They're offended because he ain't killing everybody, mm -hmm. but he might be really working his redemptive plan in the midst even of all of this stuff that's going on. Or maybe it's, again, some circumcision of our hearts that's, right. that's taking place. Again, you know, we, I, I tell you what, you know, you turn on social media, and even I, Christians are sometimes the worst on there where it's not that we, we're not even worried. We, we don't, it's almost like we've lost our love for people if they don't agree with us. Yeah, I know. You know, and we don't become the answer to the world. We become just another sounding voice of destruction towards them. Yeah, I know. You know, and, and there's not a heart of compassion. There's not a heart, you know, and I, you think about the, one of the first places they come where they're going to get their victory is Jericho. But before they, when they, when, when Joshua was getting ready to go into the land, he told the people to prepare victuals. He sends two spies in. The first person they come in contact with is this, a woman by the name of Rahab, whose house is on the wall of Jericho. And when I think, you know, Rahab was a harlot, when I think about that, it's somebody that's, that's had a lot of relationships with people that are never meaningful, but she's yeah. looking for, you know, really when you look at the heart of Rahab, she's looking for something meaningful. Yeah. But she's setting, she's living, you, you think about Rahab, because I love the stories and I love thinking of the backstory. Rahab has been living in the promised land. She's been living in this wall, but she's living in a walled city. Yeah. It means the walls have been high and built high and keeping her in to this place locked into this 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 life that's really not in abundance either even though she's living in this promised land that God's bringing these people in mm -hmm. but she tells these two these two uh spies that come in she says she's one, she's the first one that says what has taken you guys so long to get here our hearts have already melted inside of us because we heard what you did to the uh, the two kings on the other side of Jordan. Yep. We heard the stories yeah. of their defeat. Yep. We heard how it was not by might nor by power, but that when you guys decide, you know, they were, you just want to crawl. The one was like, they want to just cross through this land. They said, we just want to cross through your land. We want to use your road to get by and we won't eat from your fruits. We won't eat from, you know, we won't take nothing from you. We just want a safe passage through this, this road. And they refused. And so because they refused, God told them, go on through there and I'm going to give you that land. And so not when they could have, when that, that, that king that got defeated could have kept everything intact if he just gave them some access through the road. But because he refused, God said, I'm going to defeat him. And so the, he lost everything. Yeah. <laughs> and they inherited. You better go with the flow, in other words. And so yeah. here's, here's Rahab, though, who's living in a promised land, but she's not, she's not living in the abundance of this promised land, but she's heard. She's heard something that's really just pricked her heart. And she begins to be uh, almost like a preacher of the gospel before having an experience and telling these two uh, spies who should know of all that they've had the experience of all God's done. They've seen the kings defeated. They were a part of all that. And she tells them, what is taking you so long? Our hearts have melted. This whole, the whole land is already defeated. Our hearts have melted. We've been waiting for you to come because we've heard these stories. But what she does is she begins to make a covenant with him and says, you know what, uh, I, save me and my house. I'm gonna, she saves these two spies from the kings and, and things. And she says, you, you know, but will you do the same for me and my family? And they tell her, you know, we'll put a scarlet cord out your window and we'll know when we come in here not to do that. But what's funny is that the scripture says her house was on the wall. Her house was built on the wall. And so, you know, and I never really thought about it before until a couple of years ago. I thought about, you know, when they... Because we hear, you know, when we hear about Jericho, we like, we, we marched around and we, you know, we try to reenact that in churches. Like, we're going to go walk around the school and let the, you know, walls fall. We're going to walk around our city and let the walls fall. And not, I'm not, you know, you got to do what you feel God has put on your heart. And so I'm not mocking that. I'm just saying that, you know, they went in, we, 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 we used that scripture. They marched around the walls and we'd sing songs as kids, even in Sunday school, you know, the walls of Jericho came tumbling down and we'd all fall down and stuff. And, and, uh, but I never really thought about the fact that Rahab's house was on the wall. And so when they marched around that wall, and they're marching around, and Rahab's sitting there, and she's watching them probably march around. The, she's got her scarlet cord, and she's probably wondering how this is going to play out, you know, because everybody's hiding behind, you know, the whole thing is that the, the whole city is behind this wall, this big wall that they have built that's really kept them from experiencing the promised land as well. They're not living in the abundance of it. They're, they're trapped in these walls. And it says that when they marched around these walls on the seventh day, they marched around it seven times, and the wall came, to, and they sounded the trumpet, and the wall fell. And then uh, Joshua says, go into the house of the harlot and bring out the woman. Yeah. And I, you never, again, I never thought about her house was on the wall. If the walls fell, it wasn't hard to tell which was the house of the harlot because her house was the only one that didn't fall. Yeah. And, you know, when I think about 
that kind of, of of God and that kind of, you know, we talk about the transition of stuff. I think there's a, I think there's some people right now. We are, we, you know, we have been almost shaken. Like you said, it's easy to have a crisis of faith when you see stuff happening in the world and God isn't doing necessarily what he's always done. But I think there are some people right now that have heard something, but they have not know how to put it into place. They've not know how, you know, I believe, you know, in other words, let me say it like this. I think that sometimes we've looked at people and said, well, they're not, they don't agree with us. They don't believe like us. They're our enemy. But there's some Rahabs that have heard some gospel, but they haven't had anybody to have some compassion enough for them yep. to say, here's what we're going to do. When he said, you know, even Joshua saying, go into the house of the harlot and bring out the woman, that when he went into what, what they went to the house they went into and got the woman, they didn't bring out the same woman. They didn't bring out a harlot when they brought her they out brought of the out house. The woman. They brought out a woman who, who ends up in the lineage of Jesus. She's actually in the lineage of Jesus. Yeah. And so she, she's, there's a real transformation that takes place in this woman's heart. Just by simply being on the wall, being obedient to hang her scarlet colored cord out the window, just in hopes of saving her family. But there was a greater thing God was doing amidst of that, because when those walls fell, there was an establishment, uh, to me, when I think about it, there was an establishment of a new family right there. Yeah. She had been living in those walls. She'd been living in that bondage for a long time. She had been a harlot. Not by choice, but because that's what she had to be. She was looking for something meaningful, but never could find the real relationship. But the day the walls fell, something set her house free. I mean, the walls fell, her house got established. There was something new that she, she didn't come out of harlot. She came out of a woman that was ready to be a part of the lineage of Jesus. There was something in her house that began to be established that day. And sometimes I think we as believers, especially on social media and stuff today, we're making enemies of people Yeah, that maybe aren't enemies. Yeah, We're marching, we're, we're, we're thinking we're marching around some walls and all everybody's about to be defeated, but we're not looking for the people that God is wanting to save on these walls that really have just been trapped inside this stuff, trapped inside mentalities, trapped inside ways of thinking that they just, you know, there are sometimes you just grow up certain ways and never had an experience with anything else. You know, I'm talking about naturally, you know, there are people grow up in, in, in different households and different, they've never had an experience with Jesus. They've never been taken to church. They don't know any other way. They've been trapped inside of walls. And, you know, and for me, like I said, I believe I'm not just living, I believe I'm living in the heavens right now. I believe yeah. the heavens are available to me. And if they're available to me, they're available to every man, woman, and child on this earth right now. Yeah. And there are people, not just in America, but all across the world that have been trapped inside walled cities. And they're looking for something real, something they can really have a relationship with. And they've had relationships with all kinds of religions, all kinds of teachings, all kinds of substances, all kinds of stuff, trying to find something of meaning. Yeah. All along being in the heavens, but trapped inside of a wall and not being able to live in the abundance of this promised land. And I believe that God in the midst of this stuff is, if, if, if we that have an ear to hear, will walk around, and sometimes I think when, they, when, when the children of Israel marched around Jericho, they had to keep their mouth shut, not speak a word, yep. not say anything. And I think right now there's so many voices that are trying to speak to what's happening in this earth instead of keeping our mouth shut and of hearing what God wants to do in the midst of some stuff. Yep. See what He's doing in the midst of this earth. And sometimes we need to keep our mouth shut enough to listen to what God's doing so that when it's time to blow, the ram's horn, yep. which speaks to me always of the of the redemptive work again, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. When we begin to re, to sound that, it brings the walls down. Some houses of some people that's been trapped in them walls begin to be transformed, and their their houses begin to be established. I think about you know when Grandma Howes was alive and telling the story of. Uh, how her and Pat began uh, their journey into Christ, that Pat was an alcoholic. Grandma was at the, her ends, you know, she had seven kids at her ends meet, you know, about ready to to leave or find some way out of this and telling God, I can't live this way anymore. And then have an encounter with God that just absolutely, is somebody that day my grandma went to church. Somebody had enough sense to keep their mouth shut and blow a ram's horn. Yeah. Where the walls that were keeping our family in bondage fell down. But there was a real establishment of a real house of God in that day. Yep. Because now, generations later, we've got, I mean, my kids are worshiping and understand and declaring scriptures and, and, and things. You know, there's a, many generations later that are 
still that 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 are declaring the gospel of Christ and seeing people set free. There was something that got established on the day somebody blew the trumpet in the right way and 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 tore the walls down to set our family free. Yep. And establish not only just set us free, but establish something that was eternal. And I think in this day, it's more important for us as believers to have a real clear sounding word, not looking for enemies, not looking for uh, the destruction yep. of everyone, but man, begin to look for the scarlet color cord that might just set some people free and, and, and break the walls down that's been keeping that city yep. in bondage. Yep. You know? Well, I think the point is, like you said, is, you know, we get on, especially social media, and the point is to win an argument. I, I always say this, uh, you know, don't engage in any battle where there is no spoil, first of all, mm-hmm. but you're never going to win anything by doing that. But the powerful thought there is to go into the house of the harlot and bring out the woman. Yep. So what are you trying to bring out of people? Are you trying to bring out the worst in them? Or are you trying to bring out the best in them? Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I you know, I, I, all the years that I have been in ministry and, and had to repent, change the way I think yep. about things to continue in this journey, I still try to kind of not fight what I think is, you know, above me. I mean, and some things I think that are a little far out for me that, I, you know, I, I uh, not I not necessarily want to endorse or anything. But what I'm simply saying is, is I try to be open minded enough, you know, to think through some. And I, well, and I think know, sometimes what happens, too, is that people it's kind of like uh, what I call armchair theologians. They've read somebody else's book and they give you a snippet on Facebook. But when I go back and look at the, what the author was actually saying, uh, what he's saying is true. It's how they construe it that, that mm-hmm. just kind of muddies the water. And, and it can be that way in any message, whether it's grace, uh, the faith message. or I mean, sometimes people, you know, pollute it because I think that's how the enemy sometimes works. It just releases a flood out of the dragon's mouth so you don't know what to believe. But I do believe that the point here that, you know, that you were making, I'll let you have it back, is you got to go into the house of the harlot and bring out the woman. Bring, look for the new creation. Look for the good. Look for something to bring out. You know, well, look, so. you know, again, even for us in the new covenant, we still want to see people saved. Yeah. We want to see their life changed and have an abundance. And so when I think, you know, when I look at this stuff, to me, this is the, the gospel we preach is not just because I want my theology to be right. I, I, I'm not worried about my theology. I'm worried about people's lives. I want to see people live in the abundance of what God has for them in the heavens yeah. right now. Yeah. So when I think about the woman, the harlot, and bring, going in the harlot's house, bringing out the woman, it's bringing out some people that's really been in this bondage, being in this, that's been yeah. trapped in these, these this stuff. All across the world, we think about, you know, even what's happening, uh, you know, in the Middle East, things like that. It's still people trapped within walls. Yeah. That are trying to, f- they're, they're doing with the best they can. They think their, their relationship, they're looking for a real relationship. Yeah. But it's walls that have been built just trapping them in and keeping them in bondage, and they're not living in the heavens that's available to them right now. My heart and passion is to preach a gospel that tears down the wall, to preach Jesus, to, to, to blow on that ram's horn, yeah. and to preach Christ in such a way that walls fall. And what's left are established homes of people that are coming out of bondage and keep being come out of that, 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 that trap or that, that you know, that... Uh, just that, you know, that, that jail yeah, and coming into a place of freedom and begin to live in the, bu- the abundance of this promised land that's been all around them. You know, the, the houses they did not build, be able to drink from the, uh, the, the flowing of the milk and honey. Yeah. You know, uh, when uh, Saul said to his sons, he said, you know, we will not eat until we get this victory. His one son didn't heard that declaration. And it says he took and dipped his spear in honey and tasted it when he did, his eyes were open. If we could get some walls to fall where people can come out of those bondages and just taste of this honey and milk yep. of this promised land, yep. we'll see some eyes be open and so people really be set free. And that's really my heart and passion and really what's been my, my mission and termination throughout the midst of this pandemic is to preach Jesus in such a way that it causes walls to fall and it sets people free. And they can, their eye, they can taste of this land. They can just taste of the honey. Yeah. And have their eyes open to really see, man, Christ is for them. God is for them and not against them. He loves them and he wants to bring them in to an abundance of houses they did not build, of vineyards you did not plant. And that if during this whole time, this has been my mission. You know, or what I really feel my mandate right now is, is to just preach this gospel in such a way that we see walls fall and captives set free and people changed. Real salvation come. Mm-hmm. 
To live the abundant life. Yeah. That's through the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. You know, I think as you were saying that, you know, all around the world, people are in bondage to religious ideas that they think are the rules that their God wants them to have. But the end result of that is hatred and malice and emptiness and disappointment, disillusionment. I, I, you know, we're about to the end of our time here, but I think about where Galatians says, Paul said, you know, for the works of the flesh are made manifest, which are these, hatred, malice, envy, strife, division. But if you look at the context of, he said, you know, uh, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering. But he's talking about in that uh, uh, hatred, malice, envy, strife, division. And they which do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And we make that about heaven, and it's not about going to heaven. It's about bringing the kingdom of God into your life right now. So when he says, they which do such things will not inherit the kingdom, inheritance is not something you earn, it's something somebody died and left you. But the context there, the book of Galatians is really the Christian declaration of independence. It was for freedom, Christ set us free, no longer to be tangled again in the yoke of slavery. But he says in the beginning of Galatians, you started out in the spirit, do you think you're going to be made perfect in the flesh? So what Paul calls being in the flesh there, as you read through the book of Galatians, is doing it through human effort and works and labors and circumcisions and going back under the law. Matter yeah. of fact, the book of Galatians is written to rebuke those that are going back up under law. And he's telling you that you start out in the spirit, do you think you'll be made perfect in the flesh? So what he calls being in the flesh there is trying to do it through human sweat, labor, and effort. And he says, if you are in the flesh, you're going to have hatred, malice, envy, strife, and division. The stuff you see all over the world that's a result of religions of every kind, mm -hmm. of, of, of demands that we think a God is making on people of performance. And it robs not. us of righteousness, it peace, and joy. And it robs us of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, the kingdom of God right now. But we can have it right now if we can repent and change the way we think. Yeah. We can live in houses we did not build, eat from vineyards we did not plant. We can go into the house of the harlot and bring out the woman. We can, it was for freedom. And, and God was so passionate about freedom in the garden that He let man make the choice to, to, of life and death. And then when you make the choice of death, you can't blame God for the results of your decisions. That's your decision. Mm -hmm. And I, I tell people all the time, it's not God who takes even our loved ones. He receives them, but sometimes it's because of stuff that we've done or brought on ourselves and not even stewarding our own bodies sometimes. Well, we're out of time. Mm -hmm. I hope you've enjoyed this segment with us. Pastor Jeremy, you can contact him. There'll be something on the screen about him in just a little while. But if you'd like to sow into the ministry, go to the website there at linhouse.com. There's a place where you can give via credit card. Uh, or debit card through our PayPal hub there. You can also send a check or money order to the address that will come on the screen, or you can call the number on the screen and someone will take your credit card over the phone. But do it today. We do need your help. God bless you. Until next week. I am excited to announce the release of my latest book titled The Great I Am. In this book, we will explore the seven times in the Gospel of John that Jesus says, I am. When he uses that phrase, it is always in contrast to something from the Old Covenant. For instance, they thought Moses and the law was the door into the sheepfold, but Jesus said to them, I am the door. They thought that Israel was the true vine, but Jesus said to them, I am the vine, you are the branches. As you read the pages of this book, you will discover that Jesus removed the covenant of death and replaced it with the covenant of life. Get your copy of the book, The Great I Am, today.